Hey guys, we are the Latter-day Disciples. Our team is dedicated to helping you boldly live the gospel, recognize the signs of the times, and prepare for the return of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We invite you to join us in our mission through our daily and weekly podcast series, connecting with us on social media, and visiting latterdaydisciples.com. We pray you are enlightened and empowered through this podcast episode. Thank you for joining us. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Latter-day Disciples podcast. I'm excited to be joined today by Elisa Davis. Elisa is a convert to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and she lives with her husband and three children in the Pacific Northwest. She was raised as an evangelical and was later disillusioned with the gospel as it was taught and experienced in her evangelical environment during a divorce from her first husband. Hungry for a deeper understanding and experience of both spiritual and doctrinal things related to the gospel, Elisa spent several years in the Hebrew Roots Movement studying the Jewishness of the Bible and the Jewish context for the New Testament, and in the Charismatic Movement as typified by Bethel Church in Redding, California. Still not satisfied as the Spirit taught her about truths regarding things like the premortal existence and the importance of sacraments, Elisa then found herself in the Episcopal Church of America, where she was a member for a decade before joining the Church of Jesus Christ. Now, Elisa seeks to use the experiences and lessons learned on her spiritual journey through many versions of Christianity to enrich her own experience and testimony as a member of the church. She loves to share these gifts she's gained through those experiences with others. Elisa is also a blogger for our Honey and Lilies yeah. blog <laughs> through the Latter-day Disciples platform. And we so appreciate the work that she does um, written on our website. Definitely go check out her blog post if you haven't done so already. But Elisa, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. And I That's really enjoy being a, a blogger for the website. It's um, been, as I've become a mother with small children has become something that's really been hugely supportive for my own um, spirituality and being able to take that time to really focus and learn. It's, I love it. I love hearing that. Thank you. Well, and we so appreciate you. You put a lot of time and thought into those blog posts and they're rich with information. Her segment, your, your segment, Elisa has more to do with mm -hmm. um, understanding Christian liturgy and traditions, holidays, mm -hmm. Uh, different yeah. celebrations that you have found to be meaningful in your own spiritual journey and, mm -hmm. and also that you've brought into the LDS faith. So can you talk a little yeah. bit more about that? Uh, gosh, it's like, you start at the very beginning. I grew up evangelical. Um, I've learned that not a lot of LDS people know what that means to be evangelical. So when you think of your standard American Christian, um, who goes to a church that's in like an old warehouse or, um, a convention center or something like that, uh, your classic conservative Christian Americans, that's the evangelical world. The evangelicals are, um, in my opinion, kind of the natural end of the great apostasy where you have break off after break off after break off after break off, where truths and doctrines just keep getting shed, you know, left and right. Um, and the evangelicals are kind of like the tail end of that, um, in my opinion and experience, where there's not a whole lot left. Um, there's certainly no traditions. Uh, there's certainly no ritual or liturgy or um, any sense of the sacred. It's really just me, myself, and Jesus. Um, where it's 100% about my personal relationship with Jesus Christ and in Protestant evangelical doctrine, you don't even have to be baptized. Um, when I was an evangelical, we took the sacrament two or three times a year. Like it's shed so much that there's really not a whole lot left. Um, and so I found that super unsatisfying as I went through some really, really difficult times in my life. Um, and so, you know, just through circumstances, spent time learning about, you know, the Jewishness of Jesus and the Gospels, spent time um, really trying to seek like an experience of the Holy Spirit um, and what that meant, and um, just wasn't satisfied with any of those experiences. There was always 
something missing. Um, and um, when I was younger, after high school, I had spent a few months in England. And at that time, I had visited a little countryside Anglican church. And it was such a positive experience that I decided to try um, the Episcopal church simply because it was closest to my house. Um, went there and just never left. And I learned a lot of things in that tradition that really helped to um, grow and mature my faith hmm. um, in some really significant ways. Growing up as an evangelical, it was a lot of hellfire and brimstone. Um, you know, if you're not saved, um, then you're going to hell. And everyone around you is going to hell. And, you know, your baby cousin's going to hell. Your aunt and uncle are going to hell. Your friends are going to hell. Everyone's going to hell. And it's your responsibility to do everything you can to convince them of Jesus Christ and convert them. Because if you don't, then you're going to be called into account and questioned at the end of things um, as to why you didn't do more. So very anxiety inducing. Um, and so I was always so afraid of hell. Like, was I saved? Had I done enough? Like, was my baptism real? Because I never felt like an overwhelming experience of the spirit. I never had like burning in the bosom as, you know, an LDS parlance. Um, and so there was just so much anxiety um, built up around it. And in the Episcopal tradition, because it comes out of break off of the Church of England. Um, so when you have the American Revolution and you're, you know, fighting the good fight against the Imperials, you can't exactly have a church that has the King of England as the head of your church. So they broke off. And then the Church of England is a break off of the Catholic Church. Um, and so the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church are what they call uh, Protestant in doctrine, but Catholic in practice. And so I got to experience a lot of these really ancient practices um, through the Episcopal Church that I never saw or experienced in my evangelical Protestant background. And those ancient practices, things that have been practiced by my ancestors as somebody with a um, European ethnic background, practices that have been practiced by martyrs, people who suffered incredibly for their faith, I found those things to be incredibly anchoring and centering to my own faith, where it was no longer about, do I have the feelings? Do I feel the spirit? Do I feel God's love? Do I feel this? Do I feel that? Um, do I feel like inspired in my own prayers? Am I having this really meaningful prayer experience that I'm just kind of generating up for myself uh, out of whatever I have going on inside of me at the time? And it allowed me to just have a sense of rest in all the uncertainty I was going through in my spiritual life. Um, all the, the questions I was having around God's love, the existence of God, you know, what does spirituality mean? What does it mean to have a prayer life? Um, so many things. And I just found that my faith deepened through that decade that I spent in the Episcopal Church to the point where I no longer have any anxiety about my eternal destination, the eternal destination of the people around me. Um, I'm very comfortable with the unknown. I know that's one thing that people in the LDS Church can really struggle with is, you know, well, did you know this about church history? And did you know this about Joseph Smith? And what about this doctrine point that is never really gets clarified? Or what about this question, that question, CES letter, and, you know, all these things. And um, I'm just completely unfazed by all of that because I've really learned to be okay with not knowing. I really learned to just rest in mystery and be comfortable with the fact that God is bigger and greater and there's always going to be things that we don't know and that's actually a really beautiful place to be because um one of the aha moments I had in the school church was realizing that the place where miracles happen is the place where you have to enter into the unknown like when 
um, Jesus heals anybody, it's because they've done everything they can. The woman with the issue of blood, she's done everything she can. She's seen doctors, um, you know, the people with leprosy, they've been to the temple, they've had, they've repented. They, the, the daughter of Jairus who's died, like everybody's done all that they know to do. And when Jesus shows up to do these miracles, they laugh at him and be like, we've done everything we know to do. We've done everything that there is to do. And Jesus says, but wait, there's more in the unknown. And that's where he shows up. And so that's one of the big things that I learned in my time in the Episcopal church, because whenever there's a, uh, a point where something just is not super clear, doesn't make sense. They just go, it's a mystery. And they're completely okay with that. And that mm -hmm. was like, a mind-blowing moment for me because in protestantism and evangelicalism and i do see some of this in lds culture too just this anxiety to know all the answers um and you know there's so much freedom there's so much peace and just being like yeah it's okay to not know everything it's mm -hmm. okay to be a finite human being god is big enough to make up for what we don't know and don't understand mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really beautiful principle. And I love how you experienced that true thing being preserved in another Christian tradition. I think a lot of the times we um, somewhat inadvertently, but still pretty obviously tend to look down on other Christian faiths and say, especially you know, anything that has the scent of cat to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that that's, that's a leftover from our tradition. We've had some mm -hmm. false teachings that, that were handed down to us that really, I, I think it was McConkie in yeah, particular, McConkie was, was pretty, pretty anti-Catholic. He was really hard um, on the Catholic church. Yeah. And, yeah. And, um, <laughs> and we, and we continue to kind of struggle with rooting that out. We definitely have mm -hmm. some really strong biases against other Christian faiths on this platform. We recently did an episode with a guy named Jordan who's an artist and he's Catholic and mm -hmm. it was wonderful. And it was so great to talk to him and to pull these threads of truth that, mm -hmm. um, that we shared that were a commonality. Yeah. And I think, unfortunately, sometimes I'm going to use Mormon in the Mormon, right. <laughs> tradition of things. Uh, we tend to get really, um, arrogant about the truth yeah. that we have to the point where we don't look at other faiths, Christian, yeah. Western, or otherwise, to see, you know, they have truth too, and their truth hasn't necessarily been adopted into us just quite yet. And so it's really important for us to be more open-minded and to humble ourselves and to recognize mm -hmm. that we have a lot to learn. And I think that this principle yeah. that you've pulled out, um, being comfortable with the unknown is a huge truth that we would be well off to take more seriously and to incorporate into our own faith life, because you're right. Yeah. We, um, we tend to be very fixated on the answers that we believe we have mm -hmm. to the point where we don't use that phraseology of it's a mystery. We don't know. And of course, mm -hmm. I, I think that there's a balance to be struck here, right? Because yes. We, you don't want to go the opposite way and say, well, we just don't know anything too bad. Like you want to right. acknowledge this is a mystery and then you want to go and yeah. ask questions and, and exactly. dig deeper and realize that there is more truth to be had. There is always more truth to be had. Um, a lot of our understanding of the gospel is very elementary. And so in acknowledging that actually we don't know as much as we think we do, that there is mystery, that there is unknown. I hope that that will give us permission to then ask questions and to dig deeper. Right. Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I think for me, um, being a convert, I'll just say a little bit about my conversion process. And if you want to know more, we can talk about that. But for me, I never got like a witness of the spirit or had a spiritual experience that some people do around the church, the Joseph Smith, the Book of Mormon, all of that. It was very much an, an intellectual thing for me. And largely because of my, the knowledge I had gained through Hebrew roots and the Episcopal church, um, I saw consistent threads through all of those traditions leading up to the restoration. Um, 
And so it was really kind of jarring for me to, to have to make an intentional choice to move into this church that wasn't easy. It was very much a, okay, God is, I know God is asking me to do this and he's asking me to just trust and be faithful because I really don't, I really didn't have an overwhelming desire to join the church. We're like, yes, this is where I'm supposed to be. No, I, I still feel very uncomfortable in this church, but it's, I'm having to choose to be faithful to what I feel like God is calling me to. And one of the things that's made it so difficult for me is I feel, or I I've, um, feel like I've observed some really, for me, unsettling parallels between LDS culture and Protestant evangelical culture. Mm. Things that I thought I had left behind when I left evangelicalism, but now I see it in this church. Um, and it, it drives me nuts. Mm -hmm. And one of those things like we were talking about is this um, really unhealthy need to be right. Mm. Uh, this, this need to be certain in our knowledge. Like I know the truth. I know what the correct doctrine is and everybody else is wrong. And I need to avoid anybody who disagrees with me because they are, you know, dangerous. Um, and that there's a lot of that in the evangelical world where from my perspective having grown up in it and then left um it's salvation based on knowledge mm -hmm. versus salvation based on faith and evangelicals like to throw at um members of the uh, latter-day church that, oh, you, it's, you do salvation based on works, not faith, when the reality is they don't do salvation based on faith either. For them, it's 100%, do you believe in the right knowledge about who Jesus is? Do you believe in the right knowledge about what the Bible is or what it means? It's all about, do you agree with our doctrine, our theologies, what we think up here about what is true versus faith, which is, comes from the heart? And one of the early heresies that the um, early church faced in the first several centuries was Gnosticism. And Gnostic Gnosticism referred to um, salvation based on secret knowledge. So it was a secret society where as you go through the levels, you gain more and more knowledge, but it was based on knowledge. What you know up here is what saves you. And so I see evangelicalism as a form of modern Gnosticism, where it's it's not salvation based on faith. It's salvation based off of, do you know the right knowledge about Christ? And I see that in the LDS church, which really unsettles me because there's so many beautiful things about the church and there's so much to learn, but people get hampered down um, in that progression that we're supposed to go through by being so certain that they're right and they know mm. what it, things are supposed to be. Um, when there are so many other gifts that can be given to us, especially I feel like from some of these other Christian traditions that are older, um, in the grand scheme of things, the Latter-day Saint church is very young and when you have some churches like the Catholic church that have had, you know, nearly 2000 years of history where they've gone through these incredible periods of history that are incredibly difficult. There's, you know, you know the people in those churches have had to figure out how do we sustain ourselves? How do we sustain our communities? How do we sustain our faith in the face of wars and famines and persecutions and, you know, all the, the darkest things that people can experience. And they've developed these incredible tools over time um, that really help support um, individual faith and, com and community faith. And those are the gifts that I experienced in the Episcopal church that I feel is for me really supportive of my 
now journey through this church where even for me going through the temple the first time, I had so many people tell me, oh, just, it's okay. Don't be overwhelmed. There's a lot of symbolism. Just take a deep breath. It's going to be okay. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like, what's this going to be like? Oh man. Um, oof. <laughs> like okay take a deep breath here we go and then I go through the temple and I'm like oh yeah this is not so bad this is pretty comfortable actually like no big deal and I think mm -hmm. a lot of that was because I spent so much time in the Episcopal church where we do um ritualistic symbols where mm -hmm. people wear funny clothing where we pray in unison like mm -hmm. There was so much that I was already familiar with when it comes to ritualistic liturgical worship, which is what the temple is, that it was very, a very comfortable experience for me. Um, mm. And I feel like that's one of the biggest things that um, like a, a Catholic tradition can bring to us and our families is um, helping us to create a little bit of the temple in our homes mm -hmm. so that our children when they grow up and they go to the temple it's not like this bucket of water in the face because it's so unfamiliar um mm -hmm. that it creates these really negative experiences because I can't tell you how many times I've heard people talk about how negative their first time in the temple was because it was mm -hmm. so unfamiliar and you know the the funny clothing and the rituals and like it felt cultish um to them and that's just purely and simply a matter of unfamiliarity it's not cultish mm -hmm. not at all you just need to go to an orthodox church or a catholic church or you know um anything like that and you'll see just as much if not more ritualistic behaviors there as you will at the temple um it's just a matter of unfamiliarity and i feel like we can do so much for our children and even for ourselves by trying to bring some of that into our own private practices in our homes um because the temple is sacred space and people very much experience that when they go to the temple we're like oh wow this is different from the outside world this i feel so much more peace i can hear god more clearly um but in addition to sacred space we can also create sacred time mm -hmm. and i think that's huge because sacred time we can take with us anywhere mm -hmm. you know, we don't have to live near a temple or anything like that because where I live I'm hour and a half away from a temple and with you know small children and a teenager and busy lives like I we're not we're not getting down there every other weekend or whatever it is you know mm -hmm. so being able to create those moments of holy time in my own home um, is really, really important and really critical. And yeah. the things that I learned in a, a liturgical Christian tradition really give me the, gives me the tools to, um, to yeah. know what that looks like. And I don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And I, I want to talk about some of those traditions that you feel like you've been able to pull from the Episcopalian mm -hmm. tradition into your practice of the LDS faith and and how that has helped create a culture of ritual. Um, mm -hmm. Ritual, I think certainly is understated. We do it all the time, mm -hmm. but we don't even recognize it. And then right. when you're introduced to a whole new level of something that is highly ritualistic and ancient in origin, um, that can be really overwhelming. Before we go there, I wanted to step back just a moment and hit on what you were saying about how you've started to see a lot of parallels between Protestantism mm -hmm. and LDS culture. Um, I think this is really important for us to think about because in a lot of ways, it seems that our doctrine has kind of become more of that, more of a Protestant or even an evangelical um, sort of view mm -hmm. of the world. There are some slight differences, like as opposed to a heaven and hell dynamic, we have a right. three-part heaven and a hell dynamic, yeah. um, but it's I don't really, really see the parallels close. in the, in the um, doctrines. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. more okay. in the culture, um, the culture and how people, okay. how people relate to each other, how people relate to their spirituality how people relate to the church um yeah. and i can understand because there are elements of uh, evangelicalism that are really appealing it's a lot mm -hmm. of flashing lights it's a lot of fun music it's 
about there's a lot of just entertaining people in order to get them into the seats. Mm -hmm. There's this idea of, you know, if we're entertaining enough, then they'll come fill the seats and hear about Jesus. And we want them to hear about Jesus. So let's figure out how to be more entertaining. Um, mm -hmm. And, and the, which is, just a, that, which is just an outward, it's just focused on the outward, right? Instead of, instead of the inward work. Yeah. I mean, the intentions are good because they want to get mm -hmm. people in the seat so that they can hear about Jesus. But then you end up with there being so much emphasis on the entertainment aspect of it that the, the doctrine gets watered down. It gets simplified and simplified and simplified and simplified. And I see some of this in LDS church and culture where we're like, let's just focus on the basics. Let's mm -hmm. simplify, simplify, simplify. Um, I've only been through the temple since the most recent changes, but I've talked to people who've been through it before and I go, Oh, I think I would have preferred the earlier version. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> because there've been so many things that have been simplified that now going through the temple was like a spectator sport where I just kind of had to sit back in my, you know, I've had a chair and be like, Oh, I'm going to watch a movie. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. In about 45 minutes to an hour, I'll carry on. And it was, uh, that was uncomfortable for me because it was so familiar to an evangelical mm -hmm. worship service where you just sit back in your padded chair, you listen to the music, it makes you feel good. You listen to a sermon and then it doesn't really require anything of you. Um, mm -hmm. And that's not going certainly... to feed our souls. That's not no, going to I... give us the, the bread and the meat that we need that we have to chew on and work on. It's kind of mm -hmm. like Wonder Bread, where Wonder Bread is like, okay, let's make a, a simple product that's easy to replicate so we can get it into as many mouths as possible. But then you end up with something that isn't going to actually feed you. Mm, that's so, really interesting. You, yeah, really interesting parallels that you're that you're pointing out there. I definitely think, you know, it's it's kind of a conflict, right? Because on the one hand, um, in simplifying things, um, there is a loss, as you were talking about, there's mm -hmm. a loss of that ritual that's supposed to be teaching, right? And so going back to the point idea of ritual of, is to teach. Exactly. So going back to that whole idea of Gnosticism, you know, Joseph Smith said that a man or woman is saved as fast as they gain knowledge. So there is a mm -hmm. knowledge aspect to faith and to, yeah. to, um, to growing in a relationship with God. I think what you meant more is, is not so much that, um, that there should be a de-emphasize on learning so much as that we need to be open no. to the idea that we don't know as much as we think we know. <laughs> I just wanted to make that clear because I think sometimes yeah. we get this conflict where like we hear Gnosticism and it sounds like such a like bad buzzword. And I actually think that the Gnostics mm -hmm. had a lot of really interesting, intriguing ideas that would be mm -hmm. worth considering. And I think that some of the like rich ritual that we've had in the past mm -hmm. kind of reflects some of those things. Right. And so like there yeah. definitely is a place for learning mysteries the problem yes. is, is that we don't go learn the mysteries because we think that the basic elementary Wonder Bread version that we have is the mystery. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, yeah. I think the catch, right? And so I totally yeah. agree with you it's, that I think that it's, in moving away a, from the richness, we are losing something. And, yeah. and that's important for us to think about because that is an invitation to learn something. And if we're removing mm -hmm. that, it's going to make it a lot harder to learn the things that will actually bring us into that relationship with God. Yeah. Yeah. Simple isn't always better. Yes. Yes. And so, and, and knowledge is important, right? Faith is supposed to turn into knowledge, not the other way around. I think right. that's the other thing we were talking about too, right? Is, is yeah. that it's not bad that there's an emphasis on knowledge. We just have to know that it starts with faith and correct knowledge, right? Belief well, in correct And I think it's like putting the, the, right. I think it's putting the cart before the horse. Mm -hmm. We seek after and we gain knowledge because we've been saved. Mm -hmm. You know, we love others yes. because he first loved us. That yes. becomes the catalyst for those things. We don't yes. get saved and then go, oh, I'm good. I've got my ticket to heaven. Right. Woo, dodge that bullet. Um, right. No, it's being saved and receiving um, that gift is a call to something higher. 
It's yes. the start of our journey, not the end. Yes, absolutely. And I think that, you know, we in Come Follow Me recently, we were studying Alma 37, 36 through 38. And I love the thing that he said in there um, that, you know, I had been born of God and that's the only reason I knew these things. And I, mm-hmm. I think that pursuing that spiritual rebirth that is our, that is the entry to the gate. And then we can move forward into the knowledge and the experience and the actual development of that relationship, as you were saying. Mm -hmm. So yeah, really, really great points. Okay. So let's go back and talk about some of the, uh, some of the traditions from the Episcopalian Mm -hmm. religion that you found really helpful for, um, creating more of an environment of a lived religion and yeah. ritualistic practice in your home. Okay. And so the Episcopalian traditions are really Catholic traditions. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, there's there's no, there's really no difference. There might be some difference in like the words that are said or a little bit in how things are practiced, um, but it all comes from that Catholic tradition that developed over time. And one of the ones that's huge for me that was really a big part of kind of saving my faith that is going to be kind of controversial Mm -hmm. um, is ritualistic prayer. Mm -hmm. So just like in evangelicalism in the LDS church, there's this thing against rote or empty prayer, Mm -hmm. um, which is really funny because all of our sacrament prayers are rote prayers, the Lord's prayer is a rote prayer. And that's in the Bible, the disciples say, you know, master, teach us to pray. Mm -hmm. He gives them the Lord, what's called the Lord's prayer. Um, And that's a prayer that is actually said every single service by the entire congregation in unison um, in every Catholic Anglican Episcopalian service. And so for me growing up evangelical, I always felt like so much pressure to pray whatever's in my heart. Mm -hmm. And my experience of that was, well, my heart is anxious. So I'm going to pray anxious prayers. Mm. My heart is lonely. So I'm going to pray lonely prayers. God, where are you? Why, why don't you hear me? Why aren't you showing up for me? So I always ended, you always end up praying whatever's in your heart, um, which can feel very, very empty because if you're anxious and you're praying anxious things or you're lonely you're praying lonely things or you know you're doubting and so you're praying doubtful things like it it's not really all that helpful for your faith um but in the um catholic tradition they have free form prayers that people pray in their personal life, but they also have rote prayers. And the amazing thing about those is it allows you to take from the experience of other people who have gone through hard things before you, who have come out the other side and you can pray their prayers and you can take what they've learned and you can start to integrate it into your own prayers. There's a saying in the Episcopal church um, Lex orandi, Lex credendi, praying shapes believing. So rather than praying what I believe, I believe what I pray. Hmm. So for me, my favorite wrote prayer, wrote prayer is the Lord's prayer. When I don't know what to pray, when I'm feeling anxious, when I'm feeling lonely, I pray the Lord's prayer. I take that moment to stop, focus myself on my heavenly father on Jesus Christ. And I say, my father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those or forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Um, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and glory forever and ever. Amen. And I take that moment and I just remind myself of what's important. I, my life, my faith, my well-being is dependent on my father. He is the one who gives me bread. I need to forgive others. 
if I'm feeling anxious or, or hurt because of something someone else has said, I'm like, I need to forgive. That's where it starts. And so the Lord's prayer is becoming a powerful tool in my life where I can just be like, okay, let's, let's refocus. Let's regroup. Let's let my prayer shape what I believe hmm. rather than what I believe shape what I pray. Yeah. Um, that's really beautiful. That's been a powerful, powerful tool for me that I gained from being in a church that practices wrote prayer regularly. Yeah. That's really awesome. Well, and I wonder if maybe we should redefine what rote means, right? Because we've we've mm-hmm. kind of grown up with this tradition that rote just means using the same words over and over again. And that's what God doesn't mm-hmm. want. I don't actually think that that's a good definition for it. I think maybe mm-hmm. uh, um, a different word that we could associate with rote is written, right? This is a prayer that mm-hmm. is written down that you can refer to. And I know that other Christian faiths yeah. have um, prayer books where like they actually have books full of prayers. I have one back on my bookshelf. (laughs) I think I, I actually don't have one, but I think that that idea is really beautiful. And we could refer to that as quote rote prayers because they are written. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but much more than the words that we're using, I really think that, you know, the scriptures that say, don't, don't pray, rotely don't you know don't use repetitive Mm -hmm. prayers or something like that repetitive prayers yeah yeah I really believe that what God means about that is much more about our intention right Mm -hmm. like if if we're praying because I'm about to go to bed and that's what I do and so I have to do it and my heart's not really in it I think that could be considered a lot more rote as in like repetitious Mm -hmm. than a prayer that actually putting my heart behind, even if it is like this, Mm -hmm. like desperate calling out to God, I don't feel like praying, but I know I need to connect Mm -hmm. with you. And, and this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to use words that were already written for me. I think there's a big difference in those things. Yeah. But even like when I was going through my major faith crisis and I was at the Episcopal church was like, I don't know about this God thing. Like my life is not panning out. I, I just, I don't see it. I don't get it. I'm not feeling the love. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, and so I didn't feel like praying. I, there's actually a period of about three years where I, without exaggeration, did not pray. Mm. But participating in these rote prayers as part of a regular spiritual practice um, shaped what I ultimately believed. Mm. So th- Praying these written prayers, written by other people, shaped what I believed. Praying prayers based off of the scriptures shaped what I believed. And so praying your own words out of a sense of obligation or like the the Pharisee who's praying on the street corner so that everyone can hear him. And he's like, I am so spiritual. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're you're looking, right? You can see me? (laughs) Awesome. All right. Let me pray. That's the kind of stuff. But anything that comes from a place of humility, mm. desperation, mm. longing, even doubt, mm. doubt is so important. You can't mm. have faith unless you first had doubt. And I think doubt gets a bad rap, mm-hmm. um, but it's so important. Doubt is the stressor that causes the seed of faith to grow and get stronger. Right. We shouldn't be afraid of it. It's asking questions. Right. And that's, that's a part of that journey that we talked about that journey to true knowledge. We don't get there if, unless we're asking questions, if we think we have all the answers, Mm -hmm. then we're not going to gain in knowledge. And so doubt. Questions are wonderful. Another thought that I have in terms of rote prayers and a place that that might be applicable is the idea of casting out. Right. Mm -hmm. If you start recognizing that we are influenced by malignant spirits pretty much all the time Mm -hmm. there's a strong tendency to realize like oh I need to be casting out a lot more often and sometimes a quick written um Mm -hmm. predetermined prayer is really the best thing there I I don't know how many different ways there are to cast out honestly (laughs) (laughs) um it's it's kind of straightforward you're invoking the name of the lord and Mm -hmm. asking for the removal of anything that is harmful and inviting in all the things that are spiritually beneficial to us. That's another example of where I feel like a rote quote, wrote as in written predetermined Mm -hmm. prayer 
honestly, I feel like is really natural. Like I, there's only so many ways to do that. Right. And so, yeah, and then you don't have to think about it. You just have to right. put a nice punch behind it, put your intention behind it. And again, the yeah. intention is really the thing that I think matters the most to God is why are we doing it? And, and putting our heart and soul into a prayer, even if the words have been previously written for us is actually a really beautiful practice. I love what you said about praying the scriptures. So when we mm -hmm. come across blocks of scriptures that were like, oh man, I really want to be that way. I, I want my life to manifest mm -hmm. God in the way that these wonderful people in the Book of Mormon manifested God. God, please help me do this. And, and reading those scriptures and saying, God, this is what I want. Like help my life to conform to that. I think that that's a really beautiful and powerful idea. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So we talked a little bit about wrote wrote, written, right? Predetermined yeah. prayers. Um, what other things that you found in, in the Catholic, ritualistic in the Catholic kind of the yeah. way that you've brought with you into LDS? Faith? Um, I think one of the other big things is just the liturgical calendar. Mm -hmm. um, so the Christian liturgical calendar is kind of a, a natural offshoot of the Hebrew liturgical mm -hmm. calendar. Um, there are definitely parallels and things that developed um, as a, you know, kind of like a, an extension or a, a, a next phase of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like Pentecost is uh, Shavuot. We all know that Easter is Passover. Like there, there are very much clear parallels and connections between um, what what they focus on and symbolize, but also prophetically mm -hmm. um, what those things mean. The only one that doesn't really have a connection to the previous Hebrew calendar is Christmas, which I know everybody loves Christmas, but ironically enough, it is the most Catholic of all of them because <laughs> Christmas did not even exist mm -hmm. until after the Catholic church became the church of Rome. Things like Easter, um, Lent, um, uh, uh, Pentecost, um, a lot of the other, you know, fast, there's a lot of other things that existed and have been practiced in some form pri way prior to Christianity became becoming an official religion of Rome. Those uh, traditions and practices have developed over time. Um, so they, the way they're practiced now definitely doesn't, isn't what they did in the first or even second century, but it had its roots and there's a lot of, um, things where you can look at it and say, oh yeah, that looks familiar. Um, and so those things have been huge because then it's not like this, the year's not this wash of, you know, normal, normal, normal Easter, normal, normal, normal Christmas. And then it's, it's flash and it's gone, mm -hmm. you know, where you actually go, okay, actually Easter's coming. And, but before there's Easter, there's Lent mm -hmm. and Lent is like a long period of time. It's 40 days, excluding Sundays, mm -hmm. um, where you are fasting something, you're removing something from your life because you're focusing on that buildup to Easter where you're like, okay, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And you're doing self-examination and there's, there's so much that goes into it because then your, your daily life, your focus is then like Easter is coming. What does it mean? And then you have Holy week, um, which goes through, you know, those, that final week of Jesus, where you really take the time to focus on it and think about it and experience it. And I think that's one of the big things uh, that um, this Christian tradition gave me was the ability to literally physically experience mm -hmm. my spirituality rather than it being something that happened in my head or in my feelings. It was something that I ate, that I smelled, that I touched, that I saw mm -hmm. um, and incorporated all of my senses. And then with Christmas, there's, you know, something similar where you're, you're building up to Christmas, but then Christmas day is technically the start of Christmas. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So we all know the song 12 days of Christmas. Well, Christmas is simply day one. Mm-hmm. Um, the 12 days happen after Christmas and end with Epiphany. And Epiphany is the celebration of the arrival of the wise men and is um, traditionally considered to be the anniversary of the gospel being received by all the nations, by the Gentiles. And so it's like there's this, this buildup, this crescendo, um, and it really helps to set aside these pockets of time where you're like, we're going to really focus in on this element of our faith and what it means and really focus on it because you can't sustain that kind of focus every day. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think a lot of people feel the pressure to be like, I'm 100% about Jesus today. It's not sustainable. Life is tough. Can't always do that, but we can set aside sacred time where as individuals and as communities, because there's a powerful thing about experiencing these things as part of a community where we're like, okay, we're all in it together. We're all, we're all moving in this direction and focusing on these things and having this experience together. And it, it really helps to mark time. It really helps to, um, just break up the monotony of your year and create these moments of intentionality yeah. in our life that I find really valued and, and beauty too. Yeah. There's so, I love, uh, uh, religious art. There's so much beautiful religious art that's included in all of these traditions, mm-hmm. um, special foods, special smells, special music, like, it's it just for me it, it really enriched my life in a beautiful way. Yeah, I love that. I think that there's something very true in um having an artistic aspect of our faith. Uh mm-hmm. and I think that these traditions really help encourage that as you were saying that it it is this um this unique opportunity to express love for God by Mm -hmm. enjoying some of the more finer things that are luxuries, honestly, art, music, food, those are all beautiful luxuries and blessings and putting our intention, right. Our desire and Mm -hmm. our, our aim into using those things in a form of worship. Um, I I think that that is, that, that is so beautiful. And it's something that would certainly enrich our faith life to be able to include some of those things. There's one of the things I learned when I was studying the Hebrewness of Jesus in the Bible is I learned that um, the Jewish people were actually commanded to do two tithes. There was the tithes to the temple, but they were also commanded to tithe and set aside a portion of their income every year that they were to use specifically for the holidays so that they could buy the best food, the best wine and have the best party ever because that's how they were setting apart and making those times sacred Mm. by treating them as sacred means special or different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so by making sure that, you know, they may not have gotten to eat certain foods all year long, but they definitely got to during Passover, right? you know, or, you know, during the tabernacles or something like that. And so there was a second tie that they were required to keep so that they could have really good parties. <laughs> and I thought that that was beautiful because that is it's interesting. all about that is really good to know. <laughs> beautifying our spiritual experience yes. and being like, yeah, God is good. Can you I taste God it? God wants that. Like God, I, I think that um, that is something that maybe other faiths have. That's just this passionate joy behind mm-hmm. some of these really small things, you know, and, um, making a big deal out of these small moments and the traditions and and what they do for, as far as an opportunity to worship God and then also collaborate as families, as communities. Um, I think that is really beautiful. So at this, at the time of this episode, this is, this is September. Um, what are some of the, uh, what, what's on the liturgical calendar coming up next yeah. so that we could focus on and maybe study and, and perhaps determine whether or not we want to incorporate it into our own worship. Yeah. Um, right now we're what's called the green season in between Christmas and Easter, um, which is kind of like this really quiet uh, growing period of the year. It coincides with 
with spring and fall, summer and fall, and it's like this growing, this quiet growing period. And so we're moving towards Christmas. There is uh, this book here, which is really good. Uh, LDS author. Um, he talks a lot about um, the traditions. This is a great um, introduction for anybody who's interested. Um, it's Good Tidings of Great Joy by Eric Huntsman. Um, this is a good book. And he goes into a lot of detail. This is definitely mm. my kind of book. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like I like the history. I like the detail. So he talks a lot about where the traditions came from and how his family um, has practiced it. I mm. also have other books um, that I personally use. Um, this one's called Sacred Seasons. It's a Catholic one. That's really beautiful. And she talks, she really breaks it down like day by day. Here are some of the prayers that you can say, some of these rote prayers that you can say to help you focus on like the intention of the season. What are some of the foods and some of the fun activities you can do with your kids? Um, but Christmas, um, followed by the 12 days of Christmas, and then um, Epiphany is what is next. Hmm. Okay. And then prior to Christmas are the, is Advent. So Advent, Christmas, 12 days of Christmas and Epiphany. And Advent is really fun because again, it's that, that build up. Right. The anticipation. Christmas. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for those book recommendations. That one from Huntsman looks really good. Good tidings of, of great joy. That looks, that looks awesome. Well, do you have any kind of last words, anything that you'd like to share? Anything that, you know, you feel like um, if you could share a message with those of us of the LDS faith in terms of being more open to our Christian brothers and sisters and and maybe being willing to learn from them, uh, do you have anything along those lines that you'd like to share? I think the big thing is just have fun with it. Realize that these traditions can be really fun, um, especially in the context of a, a family environment. If you have kids... Um, or even if you're just like a retiree and by yourself, this can be a, a really beautiful way of helping to mark that time so that it doesn't just kind of pass you by and like, oh, surprise Christmas. That's right. I forgot. Um, have fun with it. There's mm -hmm. so much with the internet that's now available online to just help you figure out what this looks like. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, it's just, it's fun. I think yeah. it's fun. Yeah. And I think it brings a really special spirit. Last year for the first time, um, our family did a special Bethlehem dinner on Christmas mm -hmm. Eve. This isn't necessarily in the advent cal calendar or anything like that, yeah. but it's just something that we did to be a little bit more intentional about our, mm -hmm. our celebrations. And, um, we ate foods that were more traditional to like a Judean, uh, ancient mm -hmm. kind of setting. We turned off the lights and ate by candlelight yeah. and had music and, um, and our kids, I mean, our kids are all really young in our family, mm -hmm. but it brought such a special spirit and, and they were, yeah. they were calm for about three minutes and, <laughs> uh, and it was just a really beautiful opportunity. And so I see these other traditions that other faiths have as a similar opportunity to maybe be more intentional about how we think about mm -hmm. God and and incorporating God into our life. Yeah, and I think there's a lot to be said about being ritualistic about it. Mm -hmm. Do the same thing every year. Don't do it like, oh, this year would be fun. You know, yeah. it's a one-time experience. Yeah, like but no, there's actually it. a lot of power in being like, okay, I know what's coming. I know what we're going to do. Because yes. especially with our children or even with ourselves, we're different people mm -hmm. from year to year. We're going to experience it differently from year to year. Mm -hmm. And so that familiarity but approaching it as a new person every year is going to teach us something different yeah. every year and that's one of the magical and powerful things about tradition and ritual is it has something to teach you every single time just like going to the temple it's the same thing every time mm -hmm. but you know people still expect to learn something new when they go right so we can do that Everything, in our homes too the great thing about symbolism is that the depths 
that it reaches are never ending, right? There's always more and more layers that we can understand. And, uh, and the same goes for this. And of course, I would encourage everyone to be prayerful and look for the things that really resonate with you and that you feel impressed would be impactful for your family. Um, I, I will, let's post a link to the liturgical calendar so that people can kind of see that and maybe see some of the feast days and things too. And also we could incorporate the the Hebrew calendar because I really think that a lot of yeah. those feasts and are really One of the things too. I'm actually wanting to do for my family is to actually create like an LDS version of yeah. the liturgical calendar where <laughs> um, we remember the martyrdom of Joseph Smith. Mm. Okay, so we remember on the day that that happened, we remember it. What happened? Who was he like? What did his life mean? Yeah. Um, things like remembering the lifting of the priesthood ban. Mm. You know, what mm. is that? Like there, there are so many ways that we can create our own traditions. Yeah. And it's something that I have a real passion to do is to create um, a uniquely LDS calendar oh, with some of yeah. our history and the restoration things like, okay, so let's have a special day where we remember yeah. the um, first vision and Ooh. that's like that's our focus i think i'm going to give you an vision. assignment let's celebrate it let's <laughs> create special foods let's have art projects let's yes. have special music let's let's make it that's an event beautiful. and that's something that i want to do for my family i love that i might i might encourage you to do that for a blog post as we're coming up on the end of the year and preparing for next year, I might, <laughs> I might, I might put a book in your ear and say, we need, we need an LDS. I mean, I've already mind. created a calendar that, that I use for myself. Oh, really? Okay. Well, we I just, have I just it. haven't quite figured out how to like integrate it into my own life, partly mm. because I've got a toddler and a newborn. So it's not right. like, oh yeah, Joseph Smith and my toddler is like, oh. The intentionality yeah. is really hard so, with the young kids. I feel that. Yeah. Well, I might ask you to share it with us when we share this episode because I think people, would, people would be interested in that. Well, Elisa, thank you so much for your time. And I really appreciate learning more from you and your faith journey. Thank you. Are you just reading the scriptures or have you learned to search them? If you haven't switched to using scripture notes, you haven't discovered the power of a tool designed for searching the scriptures. This incredible tool allows you to pull together search results from the standard works, apocryphal texts, and freedom documents into a collection you can study from, digging deeper with instant references to Blue Letter Bible, the LDS Citation Index, Webster's 1828 Dictionary, and more. You can even import your gospel library notes as well. Sign up now for a free trial at scripturenotes.com.